Welcome back to Complexity Papers and also welcome back to this Networks and Complexity course. If you have followed these lectures so far, you already know a lot about structure, but so far we haven't talked about dynamics at all. Let's change this. Let's talk about models of growth. Fundamentally, dynamics is a study of things that change. And because these things are changed, variables. How the variables change might depend on other quantities that we call parameters. Now, among the variables, there might be one, say, that changes on its own, like time, right? Time proceeds on its own without our intervention. We call these variables independent variables. Other variables only change due to the events happening in the system, and we call those dependent variables. For the dependent variables, we have to specify the equations of motion, basically the rules that say how these variables change. Well, as model loss, finding these equations is often up to us. So let's see how we do this. To formulate the equations of motion for a system is difficult because it requires us to predict the future. At least we need to predict how the variables will change in the future. One central insight here is that these predictions are easier if I don't predict too far ahead. I might be struggling to predict the weather here a month from now, but to predict the weather tomorrow is maybe easier. And to predict the weather in the next minute is actually quite easy. It will be like it's now, I think. Suppose we have a dynamical system with one dependent variable x that changes in time. To fully specify the equations of motion, we need to write an equation that tells us how much the variable x changes in a short amount of time. We will call the short amount of time dt for change in time, while we call the small change in x that happens during this time dx, a small change in x. So, how big is a small change? Well, that's exactly what we need an equation for. Quite generally, we can write the total change in x that occurs during the time dt as the length of the time dt times the rate of change in x, which we call r. Now, I see you're wondering, isn't it possible that r changes during this time? Because x changes and so on, right? But see, that's exactly the point of making predictions for a very short time. If our time in question, dt, is short enough, then we can neglect the changes in r. We can also divide this whole equation by dt, and then it reads dx by dt is r. So dx by dt is really only another way of writing the rate of change. Now, if the dt is small enough, then dx by dt is just the temporal derivative of x as a function of t. And we can also write this temporal derivative as x dot. Okay, let's make a quick example. Because we're in the US, say, you are just visiting your favorite bakery franchise shop, and you just bought your little plastic cap, and you are filling it from the ice tea machine. So the ice tea machine puts liquid into your glass at a constant rate. For ice tea machine example, the equation of motion is x dot equals r, where r is a constant. If we have such an equation where we have a constant on the right hand side, we can solve it by direct integration, right? So the integral is the opposite of the derivative. So we can just take the integral with respect to dt on both sides. If we integrate the left hand side, we just get x back. But to remind ourselves that x is really a variable that depends on time, let's write it now as x of t. If we integrate the constant r on the right hand side with respect to t, then the result is r times t. Right? If we differentiate r times t, we would get r back. And we can also add a constant of integration, a constant c, that is so far undetermined. Because if we differentiate it, r times t plus c, where c is a constant, 
we would still get R back. To find the value of C, let's consider what happens at time equals zero. If we put the zero in, we just get the result x at time zero is C. So that's what a C is. It's our initial value of x. We can say this is quantity x naught is the initial amount of iced tea in our cup. It is a so-called initial value. And this equation, um, x of t is r times t plus x naught, that is the solution to the initial value problem. Or we can also say it's a particular solution to our differential equation. So what this example shows is that a constant rate of change leads to linear growth, or if the rate were negative, to linear decline. Let's consider a more interesting example, such as a population of bacteria growing in a petri dish. Why is this more interesting? Well, it's more interesting because the bacteria are not produced from some external source. They divide themselves. We can describe this by a little reaction diagram like this. For every bacterium X that we have, there's a chance that it divides into two bacteria. And this division happens at a rate A per bacterium. So what does this mean for our equation of motion? We can start again from this equation x dot is r, where r is now the total rate. But the total rate depends on the number of bacteria that are already there. In fact, we know we have the rate A of growth per bacterium. So the total rate is A times the number of bacteria x. So we get the differential equation x dot is Ax. So how do we solve this equation? Well, we could try again to solve this by direct integration. And as we will see in an exercise, this even works. However, note there's now an x on the right-hand side, and x is a variable, so a function of time, that we don't know yet. So if we integrate this, we have to integrate an unknown function of time with respect to time. So that doesn't sound too easy, does it? So we will use another technique instead. That is called separation of variables. Now, how does this work? First, let's replace the x dot again by dx by dt. And then we even bring the dt back over to the right-hand side. Now, what we want to do is, we want to get all x's over to the left side that has the dx. Now, if we divide by x, then on the left-hand side, we have 1 over x dx, and on the right-hand side, we have a dt. Uh, that looks good, because now we can put integral signs in front of this equation on both sides, and it won't make it wrong. The real deep mathematical reason why we are allowed to do this is a bit more complicated. But it comes down to this. The integral is just a fancy sort of sum. The integral sign is actually stylized S that derives from sum. And you can sum over both sides of an equation without making it wrong, right? Anyway, this is what we are left with. We have two integrals that we can solve. On the left-hand side, we have the integral 1 over x dx. And what is this? The integral of 1 over x, that's the logarithm of x. And on the right-hand side, we have the integral a dt. And what is this? Well, that is a t plus c, right? We have already done this in a sense. OK, this gives us an equation for ln x. But we didn't want an equation for ln x. We wanted an equation for x. So let's do an e to the x on both sides. On the left-hand side, that gives us just an x that we now write as x of t. And on the right-hand side, that gives us an e to the a t plus c. To make this a little bit nicer, we can actually use the rule that the exponential function of a sum is a product of exponential functions. So x of t is e to the c times e to the at. So let's see what happens at time zero. If we put t equals zero in, the e to the at term becomes e to the zero, so just one. So yeah, the x at time zero is e to the c. So we can replace the e to the c with an x naught, our initial value of x. This is a particular solution to the growth of the bacteria x of t is x0 
times e to the a t. If we plot this, we get this nice exponential curve. So linear gains lead to exponential growth. If things reinforce themselves, well, we expect them to behave exponentially in time. We now see the power of this approach, right? We said it's hard to forecast for a long time. So what we did is we forecasted only for this tiny, tiny time dt. But mathematics is good at processing things in parallel. And so what happened, the mathematics of differential equations glued all these tiny predictions that we were making together to find the solution for all time for us. This is amazing, isn't it? Now we can forecast for an infinite time. For our final example, let's study an epidemic model. The specific model that we are going to study is called the SIS model. The name derives from the fact that there are two kinds of people in this model, susceptible people and infected people. So if a susceptible person meets an infected, then the susceptible person can become infected. But in time, the infected person will recover and immediately be susceptible again. So this isn't a good model for flu or so, where you have a period of immunity after you recover. Now instead, the SIS model describes things like parasitic infections, like head lice, right? Once you get rid of them, you can get them again immediately. The SIS model is described by this reaction diagram. If a susceptible person meets an infected, there's a certain chance, P, that you come out with two infected. If there's just an infected person at a certain rate R, they recover and become susceptible again. Now, here we have now two variables, right? We have susceptibles and we have infected. So this is a two-dimensional dynamical system. To derive the equations of motions for the two variables, we will translate the reaction diagram into differential equations. And this translation, that follows almost a standard procedure that is known as the laws of mass action. See, the first rule of these laws is different processes add up. This is one of the advantages of working with infinitely short time intervals, right? If you were to be making a finite time step, then we wouldn't just add up processes. There would be more complex interactions between processes. But if we do our little predictions over a very short time, then yes, different processes just add up. So each of these diagrams describes one of these processes. And to find the term that corresponds to them, we look at the variable of interest, say i, we compute how much this variable changes as the process runs one, multiply this by the rate, and multiply it by all the symbols that appear on the left side. So what does this mean? Okay, in the first process, in fact, s and i have to meet. So this process runs proportionally to both s and i. It also runs proportionally to its own rate, p. And then the change is one unit of i when this process happens once. So the total term that we get from this process is p times s times i times 1. But we don't need to write the 1. If I now consider the same process, but from the perspective of the susceptible, I get the same term, but the change in the number of susceptibles is minus 1. So for the susceptible, this process is p times s times i times minus 1. We can do the same for the second process. Here the rate is r, but the total rate at which it runs is r times i. And if this process runs once, the number of infected will change by minus 1. So the term for the infected is minus 1 times r times i. Now for the susceptibles, again the total rate is r times i, but the change in the susceptibles is plus 1. So for the susceptibles, the term is plus ri times 1. So here's our model. But how do we solve such a two-dimensional dynamical system? Well, in this case, we don't. Because this isn't really two-dimensional. We have two equations, but they are very peculiar equations, aren't they? An individual that is lost from the infected always appears on the susceptible side and vice versa. There is no birth or death in this model. And so the total number of individuals never changes. 
So this is a conservation law, right? If you write the total number again as n, you can write the number of individuals in the system is n is s plus i, and this n never changes. In this case, this is pretty intuitive, but if you ever had doubts, we could just differentiate the conservation law. So in this case, this gives us n dot is s dot plus i dot, and s dot and i dot, well, we know them, right? We can substitute them in, and that shows that n dot is zero. So the change of n is actually zero, which means that n is conserved, it never changes. If you have such a conservation law, we can just solve it with respect to one of the variables. In this case, say s. So that gives us s is n minus i. And since we now have an equation for s, we don't need the differential equation for s anymore. Furthermore, we can use the conservation law to eliminate the s in the differential equation for i. So, this gives us now one differential equation that is purely in terms of i. So now we have just one differential equation to solve. And if you wanted, we could do this again by separation of variables. But I believe this is an exercise, and instead make another point. See, often we don't really need the full solution of the differential equation. And I know that people who are new to dynamics always have this instinct to want the full temporal solution to a problem. Because this is how we experience the world, right? We experience the world in time. If we do an experiment, we do it forward in time. And so, if you do theory, we want to do the same. We want to solve the system forward in time. This is not always the most useful thing from the perspective of the question that we actually want to solve. See, often we are only interested in the long-term behavior of a system. And that is the behavior after an infinite amount of time has passed. And finding this long-term behavior can be done much more efficiently than solving the system in time. Remember what Euler said about the economy of information? If you extract a lot of information from a system, then it's going to be very difficult and very tedious to do. So here, if you find the long-term behavior by revealing the dynamics over all time, that produces a lot of information. So that is why integrating differential equations is often so difficult. By contrast, if you just find the long-term behavior directly, this can be much easier. So let's try to compute the steady states that are the states in which the system doesn't change anymore. These are also sometimes called stationary points. So what is the property that we have in these states? Well, the change is zero, right? So let's set our differential equation to zero. Oh, this gives us one condition that we can now solve for the value of i at which the system becomes stationary. When dealing with such equations, it's good to not forget what we know about the system. One thing I know about the system is that if there's no infected, there's no spreading, and hence, there's no dynamics. So i equals zero must be one of these stationary states. Let's try it out. If I put i equals zero in, oh yeah, this solves the equation. Now that we know the stationary state at i equals zero, let's look for other solutions. And because these other solutions can't also be at i equals zero, right? We are now allowed to divide this condition by i. So if we do this, this simplifies a lot, and we are left with this very simple equation that we can solve. So we now have our second steady state. It is the infected r everybody n minus r divided by p. So now that we have these two solutions, let's plot them. But the problem with plotting them is we have only so many axes in a plot, and there's now several parameters here, n, r, and p. But let's divide the steady state equations by n. So we get now equations for i divided by n, so the proportion of the population that is infected. We call this also the prevalence of the disease in epidemics. So in one steady state, the prevalence is zero, and in the other steady state, the prevalence is one minus r divided by n times p. So it seems that the first steady state doesn't depend on any parameters, and the second steady state only depends on one compound parameter, r divided by p times n. So this is a rescaled 
recovery rate, right? So that is recovery rate divided by population size and infection rate. So we could call this effective recovery rate. Personally, I find it much more intuitive to think in terms of infection rates than recovery rates, because with infection rate, more is somehow more dangerous. So in order to express this in terms of an infection rate, just let's flip this final fraction, right? Let's just move this to the denominator. And what this gives us is now an expression for the prevalence of the epidemic as a function of effective infection rate. So let's plot this. So this is what the long-term behavior of our system looks like. If you have no infected, well, you're always stationary. That's one solution. The other solution is a bit more interesting. If you have very low infection rate, well, then it's negative. But how can you get negative infected? Well, sometimes the equations permit solutions that cannot be realized in the real world. We call them unphysical solutions. And this negative part of the curve, that is such an unphysical solution. So we can just ignore it. This won't happen in the real world, right? If we increase the infection rate, then this curve becomes positive, and from now on, there can be a sustained epidemic. Of course, there's a limit of very high infection rate. This curve will asymptotically reach a state where everybody is always infected. But perhaps even more interesting is the other end. The point where the non-zero solution, the non-trivial solution, we should say, becomes positive. That is a point, again, where the behavior of the system changes. So this is another phase transition. We can actually compute where this transition occurs by setting the prevalence in the non-trivial state to zero. And that shows us that we get this phase transition when there is an effective infection rate of one. So this point where this phase transition occurs is called the epidemic threshold. And the phase transition then separates a disease-free phase from a phase where there is an established persisting epidemic. So that's part one of the video done. I hope you join me for some exercises to become a true dynamicist and see some unusual solution. Tempting, isn't it? Anyway, see you in the next one.